Hey friends, we want to share with you a really special message on this episode of the podcast that just happened here on our campus here in North Carolina. Me and Melissa had the privilege of sharing with about 70 of our partners our vision behind discipleship. And when we got to the end of sharing that night, we looked at each other and we're like, somehow in that one hour, I felt like we squeezed our history, the why behind what we're doing right now, and our vision for the future of building this campus into that moment. And as we finished, I knew I wanted to share the audio from this night as a podcast so many more of you can feel what God's doing here on the land here in North Carolina. When I woke up that morning to prepare for the event, I realized that this spring marks 25 years of me and Melissa being planted here on this campus in North Carolina. And it's incredibly difficult to squeeze 25 years of your passion into one moment. But I think somehow in this next hour, you're going to hear the history of what we've been doing, the why behind what we're doing right now, and the dream for what we see in the future. You may have watched a YouTube video, read a Cultivate book, heard our music, done an online course, and in all those things, they are rooted out of what God is doing here on this campus in North Carolina. We're gonna drop you into the audio of the night. You're gonna feel the energy and the beauty of what Jesus is doing in the room. And we're gonna drop you in right after four of our staff have shared their testimonies of the way Jesus has transformed their heart here on this campus. I hope as you listen to this podcast, you'll catch Jesus's vision for changing the world, which is discipleship. And you'll hear the passion of me and Melissa's heart. I hope you enjoy this message. I've been on a lot of airplanes and I'll sit beside people and they're like, well, what do you do? <laughs> and trying to explain that on an airplane is very, very difficult. <laughs> trying to explain what God does on this land is very, very difficult. We have schools for our minds. We have hospitals for our bodies. We have gyms for our strength. Where are the schools for our hearts? I love trying to explain the school to an unbeliever on an airplane. <laughs> and I was sitting on an airplane once and I said, you know, we have a lot of schools that teach people what to do, but we don't have a lot of schools that teach people who they are. And if you try to do what you think you're made to do before you find out who you are, it's putting the cart before the horse. Amen. You have to first find out who you are, and then you find out what you're made to do. And these four testimonies that you heard tonight are testimonies of transformation. These four Sons and daughters you heard from are not the same people they were when they came through those gates, but somehow they're more themselves than they've ever been. But there has been transformation. Our mission statement as a ministry is Isaiah 61. And when you read Isaiah 61, it talks about the spirit of the Lord is upon us to bind up broken hearts. You just heard from four hearts that have been healed on this land. Not by me and Melissa, not by the program, but by a person with holes in his hands and fire in his eyes who overcame death, hell, and the grave. And comes close to the brokenhearted to heal. And when you read Isaiah 61, you see transformation happen in this word that shows up multiple times and it's the word instead beauty instead of ashes joy instead of mourning a garment of praise instead of despair honor instead of shame and an inheritance instead of disgrace ashes to beauty is crazy transformation yes everything jesus touched he transformed the first thing he touched was his baby skin on a harsh feeding trough in Bethlehem, and it was turned into a manger, and it was turned into the throne that the king slept in that night. 
And the last thing he touched was his broken body hanging on a wooden cross. And a device of execution was transformed into a symbol of salvation for eternity in one moment with his broken body laying on it. The first thing he did to show his glory was he showed up at a wedding and he touched some water and it turned into wine. Water and wine are not the same thing. Drink a gallon of both and see the difference. He transformed it from one thing to another thing. And he said, come follow me. And these brothers were fishers, but then they became fishers of men. And he reached across racial barrier lines and he spoke to a woman at the well and he dignified who she was. And she became the first evangelist and flipped a city upside down. He reached across religious lines and touched the skin of a leper and broke all the rules of the day and all of a sudden he touched the unclean and it became clean. He touched blind eyes with spit and mud and they saw color for the first time. He touched deaf ears and they heard the sound of music. He touched broken bodies. He reached into coffins and ruined funerals. He spoke outside of a dead man's tomb and just said his name and death couldn't hold the man. And then he looked at a wall and he walked through it because he was more real than the wall. And he stood in front of a group of terrified men who thought the same thing that happened to him was going to happen to them. And then he just blew on them and they left the room and turned the whole world upside down. Everything he touched, he transformed. And his plan to save the world would not have been the thing I would advise him to do if I was on his board of directors. <laughs> First of all, he hides in obscurity for 30 years. He has the most important mission that's ever been given to a human life to save the planet, and he hides for 30 years. And then he shows up with his father audibly affirming who he is and the Holy Spirit coming in bodily form and resting on him. And then he disappears again for 40 days. <laughs> That's when you like print the DVD of that moment, you sell the water that you were in, and you get your ministry going, right? Because <laughs> this guy's gotta save the world. He needs to reproduce what he's doing. And the way he chose to transform the world was choosing a lot of 12 very unique men. Most of them are boys. I mean, this is when you print the books. This is when you hold the conferences. This is when you use the power to take over the Roman Empire. And he disappoints everyone's expectation and he does this radical thing called discipleship. And then he destroys death, hell, and the grave. He resurrects, f comes out of the tomb, hangs out with the boys for like 50 days, and then tells them as he's about to ascend into heaven, this commission. Go and make disciples of nations. If I was one of those 11 at that moment, I would have been disappointed. I'm like, where's the power to take over this oppression we've lived with our whole life? Dallas Willard calls that commission the great omission. The church knows how to do a lot of things, and I love the church. I'm a part of the church, and we know how to do a lot of things. We know how to make books. We know how to hold conferences. We know how to multiply. But that commission of discipleship is not something we've done very much. We have, but I don't think it's been our priority. And if I could sum up our priority as a ministry, it's discipleship. And just like Jesus, we have limitations. 
he only could disciple 12 because he was a man and he was God and he embraced being that man. And I wish we could have thousands and thousands and thousands that we could disciple, but it just doesn't work that way. This is small batch discipleship here. And when I look at the crisis that's happening in the world, I wish we could disciple millions. But after doing this now for a quarter of a century, I just realized me and Melissa moved here as interns 25 years ago. More than ever, I'm convinced God's dream to change the world is discipleship. We are in a discipleship crisis. Like we said earlier today, if information could transform us, we would be the most transformed generation there ever was. But it doesn't transform us. With these phones, we have access to all the answers, right? But are we listening to the questions that God is asking? Because that's where discipleship starts. Where are you? Who are you? And who told you? Those three first questions he asked are what we unpack in this discipleship culture here. We have some friends that started a ministry called Hydrating Humanity, and it's to bring clean water to Africa. Um, we just filmed a documentary. We took a group of our men there last year, and um, we just filmed a, a documentary to help wa- raise awareness for what they're doing. And last week, we raised $140,000 at a worship night with a bunch of teenagers. Um, <laughs> And uh, there were a lot of teenagers there. (laughs) The Lord promised me we would raise over 100K. When I I got up to lead worship, I saw all the kids, and I'm like, there's no way. (laughs) Unless they forego their Starbucks for the next year. That would raise a lot of money. But we raised 140,000, and it's easy to talk about raising money for the water crisis, right? Because it makes sense. They don't have water. They're drinking contaminated water, the same water that animals defecate in, the same water they wash their clothes in, the same water the pollution goes into because they don't have the tools to dig down and get to the clean water that's right there under their feet. And all you need to do is bring someone in with a, with a, a well drilling rig to get down. The, God's already put the answer under their feet, right? And you just have to help them get that water. And these guys at Hydrating Humanity do a brilliant job of getting the water, not only doing that, but maintaining the wells for life and then teaching them hygiene education. And the Cajun Spurs have helped fund over 50 wells. And I was thinking, like, it's so much easier for me to raise money for that than it is for this. Like, last night, I kind of fumbled my way through the offering, to be honest. And... I got to the end, I'm like, man, it was so much easier to raise funds for that than this, because that makes so much more sense than talking about this, because our culture doesn't talk about this very much. We have schools for our minds, hospitals for our bodies, gyms for our strength, but who's talking about this? And this is the most important thing of who we are. Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart with all diligence, for it is the wellspring. So just like there's a clean water crisis, there's a discipleship crisis, and there's a generation drinking the water that the world is defecating in. And little do they know, right there in their heart are all the answers. If they would just take a moment and pause and follow him, he would dig the well so they could drink for the rest of their life. He said to the woman at the well, if you knew the gift of God that was in you, you would ask me and I would make you a river of water. So for the next little bit, we want to look back and honor our past. This ministry is 38 years old. And we want to take a moment and tell you the why of what we're doing right now. And then we want to give you a little bit of vision for our future. This ministry was started by my mom and dad. And they stepped out in faith. And 
I want to read uh, from two of the newsletters that my dad used to hand draw these covers of the newsletters. Here's one that he sent out right when we started A Place for the Heart. He drew out a map of what might happen here on the 52 acres of land. And I want to read from a newsletter that was sent out in 1986. And this is from my mom. When Ken and I met with our board on January 1st, we had no idea where we were going or how we would even get there. Like Abraham, we were going into a land we knew not. We were stepping out to begin a new ministry, a place for the heart. We mostly prayed as a board for direction. We prayed for a secretary, an accountant, an office, a computer. Oh, so many things we prayed for. It was scary. But wouldn't you know, just like God, he has met every single need. One of the things that Ken wanted to do when we met that day was talk to the board about building an office and a studio on the corner of our lot, which I grew up across the street over here on a little one acre lot. My dad wanted to build a studio there. The board asked, what do you expect to do in this studio? Ken began to share his dreams. I want a place where small meetings could be held for worship, a place to tape our sessions, to make more cassettes, even maybe a radio program, a place to paint, a building to make frames, a place to display the art, a headquarters for the ministry. Well, soon we had totally outgrown that little corner lot that we had sketched out on the table. And that's when one of the board members said, I believe what you're talking about is what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life. Let's don't dream too small. Then another board member suggested we look for some land. I knew what was in my husband's heart. We live right across the street from 52 acres he had been walking and praying over for the last 14 years. Paul asked, is that the land you want across the street? Do you believe that's the land God feels for you to have? We did believe that. So we prayed and we asked God to release the land. It had been tied up for 14 years. Four days later, I'm at church and the director of the ministry that ran that property comes up to me and asks, would your ministry like to purchase some land? We need to sell some. This 52 acres of land is $1,500 an acre. We've already been given gifts close to $25,000 for the land, leaving $50,000 to go. Our board prayerfully believes we should not borrow the money, but we should pay in cash. Nine months later, I was eight years old, and they had raised all the money in cash. That beautiful heritage of not borrowing money is the way we've built everything here for the last 38 years. Everything you saw today, we haven't borrowed any money for, and there is no debt on this land. We've built as the Lord's provided. Pete Scazzaro says that success is becoming the person that God dreamed you to be, doing his will his way, and in his time. There's some of these buildings I would have loved to build quicker. But buildings don't transform people. These buildings, all the things you toured the day mean nothing without the people in the buildings. And there's parts of building this that have been way slower than I wanted to be. And then all of a sudden, I look back over 25 years, I'm like, look what the Lord has done. Here's a newsletter from my dad Seven years later, he says, God's work done God's way never lacks God's supply. Do you see that? God's work, then God's way, and then God's supply. That quote from Hudson Taylor hung on our refrigerator door for years, but it moved from our heads to our hearts. Great phrase. It moved from our heads to our hearts the day Linda broke before the Lord saying, God, if we can't trust you and get it by faith, then don't let us have it. That was the day we left everything and we began a place for the heart. We met with friends in 1986 and we prayed for a place for the heart. We desired the land across from our home, but it wasn't for sale. We prayed and the owners approached us the next week asking if we would like to purchase 52 acres. It was the exact site we had prayed for. Then came the obstacle. We needed $76,800 in nine months. We remembered Linda's prayer. If not by faith, 
We don't want it. God didn't want us to borrow. We prayed, and he provided in incredible ways. We finally had the land, but no money. We learned how Mother Teresa once began a school for the poor by scratching the letters of the alphabet in the clay streets of Calcutta. Soon, hundreds of curious children came to learn from the woman of God who taught with all she had, a mere stick in her hand. The Lord said to her, if you wait till you think what you need to have to do ministry, you'll never do it. But if you use what you have right now, she said, all I have is a walking stick. God, how am I going to change the world with that? He said, well, Moses did with a stick. And so the next day she started drawing in the sand. Within months, hundreds of kids were around her. A businessman pulled up one day and said, what are you doing, old lady? She said, having school. And he built her her first school. She used what she had. So we used what we had. We used the land. Although we had no water, no electricity, no buildings, we, we announced the weekend retreat for men. With donated food and borrowed tents, more than 50 guys came together to love on Jesus and one another. For our final meal, Linda came up to our campsite with a five-gallon bucket of her famous Sampson County buttermilk biscuits. I lived on those for many years of my life. The men pressed the 10 pounds of sausage into patties. Thank goodness for hot campfire to cook off the germs. Linda and I began stuffing the fried patties into biscuits. We never counted the biscuits or the sausage. But when Linda handed me the last patty, only one more biscuit was left in the bucket. It was supernatural. The Lord was really in charge. That's when we fully realized for the first time that only God and God alone can make these 52 acres a place for the heart. That fall, Paul Trollinger suggested that we give to the people who helped us buy the land by having a free pig picking. That's a barbecue for you northerners. 300 people showed up. In an old cornfield, we chowed down on three pigs. That was nine pig pickings ago. This year, we cooked eight pigs, and we fed over 2,000 souls from five different states. So from 1986 to 1999, this land was growing. There's a, there's a lake on the backside of the land that wasn't here. We built what the, where you ate tonight. It was only about half the size, but we built that building. And in 1999, me and Melissa came here as the first interns. We had just got engaged, and we moved here to a place for the heart to do an internship. In the year that we were here, we built the first bunkhouse that we have named Joel and Malachi. And I had some leftover money from my college um, savings that I never used because I didn't go. And I was like, what, what do I want to do with this? And I, I, I wanted to build a space on the land for worship, just a little space dedicated for worship and prayer because my heart was coming alive with worship and prayer. And so at 21, I built this building called the Prezebo. That's my dad and Paul Trollinger, who was our original board member, whose family has been a part of building every building on the property. Paul's passed away now, and he's cheering us on from heaven, but his son Mark and his son George have helped build almost every building here. And we built this place called the Prezebo. I have no idea what I'm wearing on my head. <laughs> and I was thinking about... There's just so many God stories here, and I'm going to stay on track because I can, I can just get lost telling these stories. But in these stories are so much of the DNA of what you're sitting in today. But I remember that year, me and Melissa were doing our internship, living here on the land. And we had this date night where I asked Melissa, I said, if, if when we get married, let's say we win the lottery, we just inherit a, a large sum of money what would you do with your life? Like, if, you could, if we didn't have to work, you could just choose anything. She's like, you've obviously been thinking about this. Like, you go first. I'm like, oh, yeah, I know what we would do. We would move to, like, the hills of Ireland or Scotland, and we would live on a little cottage, and our house would be a music studio where we would spend our life feasting on love and music. And she's like, 
where are all the people at? I'm like, no, no, it's just me and you, babe. It's an introvert's dream. I'm like, we'll make some people and we'll make some music. And she looked across the table and she's like, I think that's my version of hell. And I was like, well, what would you do? And she was like, we would live in community. There would be people and we would, we'll run like schools and camps and discipleship and just people at our table. When we go to sleep and when we wake up, they'll be everywhere. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's my version of hell. Let's get married. Oh, the furnace of marriage. And, but that year, we built a cabin that we could begin discipleship in. And we built this little brazebo that I went to this morning by myself to get out of my house <laughs> to be alone with the Lord. And this, this beautiful fusion of worship and prayer and discipleship. Dietrich Bonhoeffner, who was a pioneer of community, he said, don't trust the person who can be in community but can't be alone. But also be aware of the person who can be alone but can't be in community. And we need both, right? We need that time alone with the Lord, but we need that time in community. And so what was forming inside of us was this dream for worship and community. And on our wedding day, April 29th, we were married down in the field where you guys parked all your cars. And... My dad and Melissa's dad, who's here tonight, Ron and Dee Dee, Melissa's parents are here. They married us in the field. And one of the significant things that happened, it was kind of a last minute idea, but I'm like, I really want you guys to pray Isaiah 61 over us because I feel like it's part of our mission statement. And three days before the wedding, my dad said, I got this random call from a lady who raises homing doves. Those are the doves that you release and they'll fly back to their home wherever you release them. And she wants to donate her doves to the wedding where you guys can release them. What if we read Isaiah 61 over you as you release the doves? So our first act as a husband and wife was to take birds out of a cage and have Isaiah 61 read over us. Maybe later we would start something called Cageless Birds and we would hang Isaiah 61 on the walls of what we're doing. And we would give our lives to live it out. And so after we were married, we, that summer, my parents said, we've just finished the first bunkhouse. We were here serving their dream and what, whatever this land was going to be, we didn't know. We didn't know, is it going to be a retreat center or are we going to run summer camps? We kind of had this idea of a school one day, but we weren't sure. And my parents said, we have the first bunkhouse. What if, what if we sent out in our paper newsletter an invitation for a camp and you guys could run it? And I, I think it was their idea. It was probably our idea, but it was kind of a fusion of the ideas. They gave us permission, and they put it in the newsletter. And, but what was burning in my heart was every summer as a kid, I met Jesus at summer camp. That sounds awesome but I had to get saved again every summer because how bad my school years were when I couldn't walk out what I experienced at camp. I would have these one week experiences, but I couldn't go home and, and live it out because no one taught me how. I would drink the, the water of revival at summer camp, but no one really taught me how to dig a well. And that became our vision statement for the summer camp. What if we not just give them a one week camp experience, but we teach them how to dig a well so they have friendship with Jesus throughout the year. We did like six to seven times a day, we did these things called worship commercials, where we would advertise them ways that they could go home and connect with the Lord. We were dreaming big and we had 18 campers apply because that's how much space we had. And the night before the campers showed up, I, I was very zealous in those days. And I I had kind of convinced myself the Lord wanted me to stay up all night praying for the camp because I read about how Jesus prayed all night before he chose his disciples. This isn't a good idea when you're about to lead a camp for high school kids. <laughs> Finally fell asleep at like 1237. 
And I think the Trinity was like, finally, shh, he, he stopped talking to us. <laughs> and as I fell asleep, I fell into a dream. And in the dream, I'm standing, looking down at my bare feet in the dream. It started like that. And I knew I was standing on the beach. And I was right there on the edge where the water was. My feet weren't quite in the water. And I lift my eyes up and look out into the ocean. And Jesus is standing like waist deep in the ocean. It's the first time I've ever seen him. I've dreamed about what he might look like and what it would feel like to see him like this. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm seeing him. And as I start looking into the eyes of Jesus, they're somehow bigger than the ocean he's standing in. An endless, limitless, perfect love that can't be described in words, like liquid waves of love, just begin to come out of him and inside me. And I was like, I could stand here and look at you forever. And all of a sudden, I begin to see a reflection of other people in Jesus' eyes. It wasn't just, it was like a lot of people. I could see that reflection. And then I saw this smile on his face. And I looked back over my shoulder, and there's an army of young people behind me. All the kids that I knew, the 18 kids coming to the camp the next day were right there. But behind them were just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of young people. And somehow, the same way he was looking at me, he was looking at all of them. And we were all experiencing the same thing. Only God can do that. I'm terrible at multitasking. But somehow, he was looking at each of us. And he just lifted up his hand and invited us into the deep. And we began to walk into the water. And as we began to walk into the water, we got like knee deep. And he's definitely a little deeper than he was at the beginning of the dream. And as we get waist deep, it's just his head above the surface. But we're like, where else would we go? We have to have him and what he's inviting us into. And the dream ended as we all disappeared into the ocean with Jesus. And we weren't drowning to our death. We were drowning into life. And I wake up from the dream apologizing to God for falling asleep. And I, I'm also like, oh my gosh, this is what Jesus wants to do at this summer camp. And we get that first day of the camp and I share this vision of these 18 high school kids. And Jesus shows up on this land in a way I can't describe. And there was these two campers at the camp that out of the 18 were the most... Um, like shocked at what was happening around them. Like we've never seen anything like this. It was two sisters. They'd come from a, more, a little more traditional church than what we do. And, and every staff meeting, we're like, how are the two sisters doing? Because we're just like, just gently pulling them out. I mean, they got maybe a couple steps in, it felt like. And the whole camp were like, I don't know how they're doing. Like this is so much for them. I mean, it was a wild camp. And... We finished that camp. We're like, that was, we want to do, we, we loved that. We want to do two of them next year. So we sent out in our newsletter, two summer camps. And in those days, people didn't fill out stuff online. They either called, the, they had to call the ministry or mail in their application, right? And I'll never forget, I was down mowing the grass and Melissa runs down the hill. It's a couple weeks after we sent out our invites for camp. We didn't know if we could fill up two camps. Melissa comes down the hill. She's like, you'll never believe who signed up for the camp. The two sisters. They're the first registers of the camp. I'm like, oh my God, I think it maybe worked. And we, opening day of camp, parents are dropping off their kids. And their mom comes and finds me and Melissa, puts her hands on our shoulder and says, what did you do to my daughters? She said, they've been transformed. They're not the same people. They still fight like sisters every once in a while, but sometimes they, they wake me up in the mornings worshiping the Lord. Sometimes they wash dishes without me even asking them to wash dishes. Sometimes they share and they love each other in a way they, 
weren't loving each other last year, and they've stayed on fire throughout the whole year. Me and Melissa looked at each other, and we said, we want to do this the rest of our lives. And in that first little mustard seed of the camp was the DNA of what we're doing now 25 years later. Just getting out of the way so a generation can walk to Jesus. Helping them dig the well in their heart so they can walk the long obedience in the same direction all their days. In 2005, we released an album called The Awakening. Anybody heard The Awakening? And I have, a, I have a dear friend named Adam Cox who was being mentored at that time by a man named Floyd McClung, who was a pioneer in YWAM. Floyd's passed away now. And Adam came out after we released our album, and Adam's one of our biggest fans. And Adam, we were staying up late one night just talking about Jesus, talking about what God was doing and the dreams on our heart. And Adam said to me and Melissa, he said, I... Floyd's been teaching us about how Jesus had a blessing and a building ministry. And, and he began to unpack that Jesus spent a majority of his time building into 12. And then he would depart from there and bless, feeding the thousands, doing the ministry. But most of the time was devoted to these 12. And in the 12, he was devoted to the three in a very special way that he brought into special moments from the Garden of Gethsemane to raising Jairus' daughter from the dead. And then he had one that he was pouring into named Peter in a very specific way. And Adam just said, I love your music. I think it's going to go around the world. And I love these summer camps that you guys are doing, but I just, I just what are you guys going to build beyond just bless? And it just caused me and Melissa to start asking these questions. And we were falling in love with these high school kids that were doing our camp. And in 2008, we decided to try this thing called the 18-inch journey where they would be on the land longer than just a week for, 40, for 60 days. And we had eight students come and do the 2008 first 18-inch journey. And we were like, we want to build something. And then we invited one to come back and be an intern. And in 2008, Nine, we had 11 students. Two of those came back, and they came to do an internship. And then in 2010, we had our third 18-inch journey, and that's when we had our first female interns, Martha, Molly, and Aaron. And all of a sudden, these interns are becoming staff, and they're living here full-time. And we're starting to build and not just bless. And we've just finished our 16th year of doing the school. We're still doing, we're doing two summer camps again this year. We're hosting retreats and, but the building, this model that Jesus showed us of doing life around the table. Although when you look at photos and you see all the students now, there's still a one-on-one -on -one pastor for every student who does the school. That's very true, isn't it? <laughs> that looks in your eyes every day and every week and asks those questions. Where are you? And they're in a small group, and they're doing life around the table together. This year, we've almost had 500 students come through the school. 25 nations have been on this land in almost all 50 states. Just in 2023, 17,000 meals were cooked in that kitchen. 33 full-time staff and 51, including all the kids and spouses. And I love this number here. We asked the students to take a break from dating during our school so they can really focus on Jesus. And there's been 10 marriages that have come out of our school. <laughs> I wanna tag in my beautiful wife, Melissa, to share some of the why behind this discipleship and what we're doing. Man, I'm just so grateful to have this night. The presence of Jesus is so precious, isn't it? Um, Jonathan and I have had 
the great privilege of traveling the world and leading worship with thousands and thousands of people. And it's been a ride, and it's been wonderful. But what you're experiencing, hearing about, seeing is what we've given 95% of our life to. And most people will never see it. And you're getting to see it. And there's passion in our heart and in our voices because it's been very costly. (laughs) Following the Lord is really costly. And it's not easy. And it feels like the longer you walk with him, the more narrow the path actually gets. And it's, um, it's not been easy. And I think it's, e- it, it's, it's easy to come and see and be like, wow, Jonathan, Melissa, the cage of spurs, they just like, just, things just happen and they just don't. <laughs> they just take a really long time. And I wanna give honor to the Lord for that. Um, a, a very dear friend of ours, Pete Gregg, says, Jesus often does the slowly, slowly, suddenly. And if you want to walk with him for the long haul, you have to get used to the slowly, slowly, suddenly. And so I think for us, it, it doesn't, there's not a lot of suddenlies. It doesn't feel like that, actually. It feels very slow. 25 years is a long time. And I, I get asked a lot, like, big questions, like, what do you want to be known for? And blah, 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 you know? And, and I've come to this point in my life where I'm like, just faithfulness. That we would walk with the Lord for the long haul, that we would get to the end, and like, people would say, faithful. They were faithful. And doing that level of faithful is very costly. I know that many of you know that. It's very special for me to have my parents here um, because Jonathan and I both have the privilege of having mother and father who walked with Jesus and showed us what faithfulness looks like. And I honor you for that. Our school, um, we get asked a lot. So you lead a ministry school and we have to say, no, no, we lead a heart school. And they're like, isn't that the same thing? And it definitely isn't. And while we love ministry schools, we went to them. We have a lot of affection for them. Um, What we do is not that. And there are plenty of amazing ministry schools out there that teach young and old the work of ministry. But what we have learned is that what sustains you in ministry is the work of your heart. And if you don't do that work, you will burn out and you will not make it. Amen? And so I can look back and I can see, man, I can just see the, the leadership of Jesus in our early 20s. We got married very young. I was very sick when we got married with the illness I have. And I can see it even in those years that we were, we were hungry for something more. Um, we were newly married in our like early 20s. Uh, we got, I got engaged at 19, married at 20, pregnant at 21, baby 22. And by the time we were 25, we had Haven. And so there we were, like in our mid-twenties, in full-time ministry, I'm very sick. I can barely pick up my daughter and my son. And, and, and you know, you get to these moments of struggle and suffering and everything that you think you know about who God is gets really real. And you, and you ask different questions, yeah? when pressure systems ramp up. And I can look back and I, with all my heart, I've, I've had my chronic illness for, since I was 17, I'm 44. And I'm so grateful for the pressure. And I can say that with my whole heart, 
Because when I sit back there and I hear Allie talk and I hear Mary talk and Martha and Chris and every single one of my staff could get up here and share. I know that what the Lord allowed us to walk through gave us a really different perspective for the young men and women we were going to walk with. And I know that might mess with some of your theologies. I just don't care. (laughs) Because I am a friend of God. I walk with the Father I walk with Jesus, and I walk with the Holy Spirit. I'm confident of that. I am a friend of God, and I, I pray for healing every day. At this point, it's a, it's, that's not even the point. I stood back there as I was listening to Allie talk, and I just said, man, I remember very clearly Graham Cook telling me and Jonathan, this is really hard, but you're going to make the enemy pay for everything he's pointed at you. And I, was, I leaned over Jess and I was like, man, it's people's lives that have been able to move through very hard things that are our greatest victory. This is how we make the enemy pay, by pressing in. And our, our school of the heart is about the matters of the heart because the matters of the heart are what actually take people out relationships are what take people out. Get into any church, mission, ministry, business that has imploded, you will find burnout and you will find broken relationships. Because we are not taught how to tend our hearts and tend to our relationships. And it has been a great joy to pioneer something that's really different. Jonathan and I like different things, unapologetically. And it has been one or 16 years of just grinding it out and trying new things and then f- them failing and then trying other things and then really working. We tell our students, campers, retreat guests, your heart is a garden. We want to give you tools to tend to the soil of your heart because we really, really want you to make it. The greatest thing that we desire in 5, 10, 15 years, and now it's happening, actually, is that men and women who have done our schools, retreats, camps, they'll come and say, I'm doing the work. Because we put tools in their tool belt. More than giving them an experience, we want to give them tools that will actually help them. When their backs are against the wall, when suffering is overtaking them, when loss has sent them into depression. These are real things. And we can't just slap a God is good on it. Does it work? It does not. The matters of the heart really matter to us. And, and one of the ways we, we do that is with our collectives. You got to see studios if you toured. And I, I love our collectives. And a lot of people, the other question we get asked often is, so you're an art school? Because they see all the art stuff. And we're like, no, no, we're not an art school. We're a school for the heart. <laughs> like, read the website, you know? <laughs> um, but, but we actually, we know it's not enough for students to sit in here and just take notes. Jonathan has already said it. It was one of the points he took of mine. That information... <laughs> It's fine. Information is not transformation. And we know that it it actually isn't enough to just take notes and, you know, they'll they'll sit in here. I love having a former student right in front of me. You've heard me say these things, but you know they're true. Uh, It's not enough. Like, they'll sit in here and you'll get, you'll, we start teaching and it's like, yes, yes. Like, I'm a child of God. And we're like, great. And then you walk down the hill to the pottery studio and they're like, I'm going to be an expert potter. And they sit down at the wheel, and the clay collapses, and it collapses, and it collapses, and it collapses. And all of a sudden, they're not a child of God anymore. You know what I'm saying? They're like, I'm terrible. I'm a failure. Nobody loves me. And so what happens is, in our collectives, which, which we have 
many collectives that I'm going to talk about. But ultimately, our desire is to create healthy struggle. Creativity is such a struggle. And so our desire has been, over, as a team of artists, musicians, all the things, to create healthy struggle. Because they don't get transformed by listening to us talk. And, and it's, it's amazing. I love Romans 5. We all know it. Not only so, but we also glory in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. In another translation, it says, pressure produces patient endurance. And, and I, I love, it's really important that people understand this so they don't think we're just these artsy fartsies out here like, you know, making pots and writing songs and, you know, people just think we float through the woods and just write songs, you know? <laughs> the rhythm of art, the rhythm of collectives is to create struggle so that they will learn how to ask for help. And then there's someone there that actually wants to help them. That they will learn how to persevere, that they will learn how to take risk. That they'll look deeper into a, a normal everyday moment where they like, why can't I get this? And they learn how to invite the Holy Spirit in, the helper, the advocate, Jesus said in John 14, I gotta go, because something much better is coming. It is not God with you, but God in you. And, but without practice, in simple moments, how do you learn how to do it in your simple moments? So in, our, in pottery, clay is collapsing. Pots are exploding in the kiln after they've worked for two weeks on it. Tears are flowing, you can be sure of that. In printmaking, students are digging into the linoleum a little too deep and ruining their final project that they've worked for hours and hours on. In darkroom photography, they spend hours, it takes hours to, to even get to printing a picture. They spend hours developing film only to find out that they didn't wind it right and there's actually no pictures on the film. In leather, they cut it wrong again and again and start over and poke themselves over and over again. In music, they're trying desperately to write a song from the crazy prompt we've given them. And they're wrestling with feeling like they don't have words and that they're not enough. And in movement, they're moving their body and feeling every insecurity they've ever had in their life all of a sudden on display, and it's struggle. And where there's struggle and permission, Jesus always comes. And that is a huge part of why we do this. It's to create healthy moments where Jesus can just come. And he can come through the teachers, and he can... He can come when they're hitting a wall over and over again. The process is so good. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome. It's not enough for us to give them an experience. They have to practice. And they do it in community. They do it in work duties. They do it in collectives. They do it in art. And we push them. And we push them and we push them so that they find Jesus. The last thing I just want to touch on is my staff, because they're very precious to me. And another question we get asked a lot is, why do you have such a big staff for such a small school? And I have to just explain that we're a heart school, and to create a safe environment and to create a moment where a student, a retreat guest, a camper can sit with one person eye to eye over and over and over. You have to have enough people to do that. 
And not only that, but you have to have a staff of people that are committed to the work. Because if my staff aren't safe people, when people come to the land to do heart work and it's not safe, they won't open up. We're asking a lot. If you've ever talked to a former student, a former retreat guest, it's, we're at, we ask a lot. We say, trust us, open your heart. And I just wanna give honor to my staff because they do the work. And it's very, it's a great privilege that we have walked with some of our staff for 15 years, 10 years. We've been walking with Martha, she was 14. And people often say like, wow, like people stay. I'm like, yeah, because we take care of them. Because the matters of the heart have to be worked out every day. It's one of the main reasons why we only run schools half of the year. So that the other half of the year, we run retreats and camps, but we work out our relationship through small business and to support the mission. And we write books and, you know, it's like super fun to write books. <laughs> Except it's like super hard. <laughs> and, to, and to make music. This year we're like, we should do a Christmas album. That'll be so fun. You know, like four months later, like, oh my God, why did we say yes to this? Because creativity is full of struggle. And I just want to give honor to, to my staff because they, man, they do the work. And, and to run what we, the type of thing that we do in a very, we've had the privilege of leading our staff in a very communal way. And, and that means that we prioritize relationships, the heart and connection over profit, brand, and vision. All of our staff raise support. We are on mission. And it's been a great privilege to run this race with you. You work really hard. And I'm, I'm proud of the people that God has sent to us. I'm proud of the women and the men that they are becoming and that they are. And I, I, I just give glory to the Lord. But it's important for you to know, people that believe in us and support us, that Jonathan and I spend a lot of time taking care of our people. Because we know if we take care of them, we take care of their hearts and their marriages and new parents and all those things that they will take care of every man and woman that comes through these gates. It is impossible for me and Jonathan to do that. Do you understand? Amen. Wonderful. She's amazing, huh? This team would absolutely not be here without the pastoral superpower that my wife is, the lover and the helper and the friend and the incredible leader that she is. It is an honor to co-lead this ministry with her. I know you're wondering about how that conversation panned out for us 25 years ago on that day. And I, right now I can look back at that moment when I thought I needed to live in a cabin all by myself and just do music. And I can look back at that 21-year-old boyish man and see that I would have loved to hide behind my giftings but never actually go down and find the pastor that was inside of me. And Melissa's helped me find that pastor. And when we got married, Melissa didn't sing. And there's a part of Melissa that I know, Jesus gets like 99.9% .9 of the credit, but there was, a, there was a musician inside of Melissa, a songwriter and a poet that was there, but us being in that furnace together, we've pulled out different parts of one another. And that's what community does, right? And it's a furnace and it's not easy. And so... I just want to take a moment and just dream a little bit with you guys into the future before we close the night. 
We have a card in your uh, bag there, and we're going to put what is in that card on the screen. And we've sketched out this week a vision of what we think probably the next five to ten years look like on this campus. Isn't it wonderful? The proverb says that we, we dream in our hearts a lot of stuff, but it's like there's a God who orders our steps. So, but these are some of the dreams we have in our hearts to b- keep building this campus. The menu here is not changing. Discipleship is our mission. But we are walking out a lot of that Mother Teresa faith of using what we have. We flip this building over and over and over again during an 18-inch journey. You've seen us worship in here, right, on YouTube? It takes a lot of work to get all those tables back in here for it to be a classroom. And then we'll flip it for other things. And we used to only have the farmhouse, and we worshiped and ate and did everything in that room. The bunkhouses you walk past today, we're so thankful for them, but we, have, we had 24 men from ages 20 to 35 living in those bunkhouses for 70 days, having to walk to the bathroom every day. And because they're getting such an extraordinary school, they don't complain. I really believe that we've dreamed up a school that I wish I could have gotten in my 20s. And I know we're giving them an amazing school. I'd love for them to like wake up at night and be able to go to the bathroom in the same building. <laughs> but we're using what we have. And we're so grateful for it. But when you look at the map, you can see the first 13 buildings over there are what you saw today. And in 1986, that was all woods. That lake wasn't even there. And one of the extraordinary things as we were drawing out this map this week is to look back at what God's done in the last decade. The last decade's been very significant for us. Um, Ten years ago, it was 2014. And that was a very significant year for us as a ministry and me and Melissa. Three years before that, over in the farmhouse during the first week of the school, I teach about the Father's love. And during one of the sessions, um, we were coming to a close and we were having a ministry time. And during the ministry time, the Lord was just breaking fear off all of us, me included. You know when the love of God just comes into a room and collides with your heart. And I just spontaneously sang this phrase, I'm no longer a slave to fear, I'm a child of God. The meeting ended with all of us standing on our chair just shouting it. A year goes by, we don't sing the song, 2013. We get into Father Week again and we all spontaneously sing the song again. Another year goes by, 2014, the song erupts back out of us. And as we finished that week, Melissa looked at me, she's like, babe, every time you sing that song, the atmosphere changes. Like, you need to put other things around that and make it a song. I'm like, no, that's just like this spontaneous moment we have in our school. Like, that's just for the school. She's like, more people need to hear that. And so we put verses around it. And that summer, some dear friends from Bethel Music reached out and they said, we love y'all's music. The church needs to hear your music. We're recording an album in three weeks. Do you got any songs? (laughs) Melissa's like, you have to send that song. I'm like, I don't know. I don't think it's that great. It just, it feels like the song that we just sing in the school. And little did I know this, remember the blessing and building that I was talking to you guys about? That the two were about to fuse together. And in the seventh year of our school, which seven is the number of completion, something was completed and fused inside of our hearts of what we wanted to do with our life. And then all of a sudden, God takes this little song that was born in the same room that you were eating today. You guys were sit right where y'all were sitting at your table. I, I swear I sang it. And just like Jesus took a boy's lunchbox and multiplied it and fed thousands, we handed him this song and it just goes around the world, which we're so grateful for that. As a songwriter, to get that gift given to us is extraordinary. And the night before we recorded the song, the Lord asked me, it was one of those moments where 
I didn't see him with my eyes, but I knew he was in the room. And it felt like a Solomon moment. And the father said, you're going to record that song tomorrow. I'll do anything you ask me. And I was like, can I have a moment? Because I don't know what to ask for. He's like, I got all the time in the world. And I sat for a while and I'm like, thousands of records being sold would be cool. Awards would be cool. And then I just saw all the students on the chairs singing. And I'm like, that's it. I was like, God, whoever hears this song, what we felt in that room, if they could feel that, that would be success. He's like, I can do that. And we can't do this without help. This dream is much bigger than me and Melissa. I was asking the Lord this morning, I'm like, why is it so hard sometimes to take up an offering for something you believe in, to ask for help? He's like, oh, just because it's your pride. You want, you want all the glory. You want to be the hero. Would you back away and let me be the hero? You are the body of Christ. And we can't pick this up by ourselves. And I'm not just talking about money, because I want God's will done God's way in God's timing. And buildings are wonderful, and they will change and help us out a lot. But if we don't have the people, we miss it. And if we're not growing in love, then we're not growing in success. That's his measuring stick for success. But we would love to have some more cabins. We would love to have more studios. We would love to have a worship barn where there's a video and music studio that you just, at any point, can worship in and capture it. And like that lunch, we could put it in Jesus' hands and he could multiply it. We'd love a bigger cafeteria because you guys haven't been back in the kitchen, but it's beautiful, but I can't believe Martha pulls off all those meals in that kitchen. <laughs> We have a lot of dreams for this land and we want to build it in God's way and God's timing, but we also want to confidently ask for help. Thank you so much for listening. Me and Melissa's hearts are overwhelmed with gratitude at the way God has provided for us to do this beautiful dream here in North Carolina. This is actually our 108th podcast episode. For the last 14 years, our vision is that this podcast would be a free discipleship resource to people all over the world. And we want to pause on this podcast and give you a moment to sow back into what God's doing here on the land. We have links in all the descriptions where you can go learn more about our campus campaign. You can go to 18inchjourney.com to see what we're doing right now and to sow into this dream of what God's doing here in the heart of North Carolina. If you've listened to this podcast and your heart's burning for discipleship, you can check out our website to see the schools, the camps, and the retreats that we're hosting right now. And we've also been working really hard as a team to develop discipleship resources for people that can't come to the land here in North Carolina. We have our beautiful Cultivate books. We have online workshops. We want to be releasing more through this podcast and through our YouTube to encourage you on your journey with Jesus. Thank you guys so much for listening and thank you for believing in us. Mm -hmm.